Let me thank Mason for being here today. He's the Executive Director and Chief Scientist at the Whale Center of New England in Gloucester. He's been working with humpback whales since the early 1980s, um, particularly in New England, um, doing research and whale watches, so he knows the whales of the region quite well. He's published numerous papers and articles based on his work, and he's a member of the Atlantic Large Whale Tape Production Team and the Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary Advisory Council. He's also the Vice President of the American Cetacean Society. So, Mason, thank you very much for being here, and I look forward to your remarks. My pleasure. It's great to talk to you guys. Our, our group's had a long history of collaborative work with the aquarium, and, and it's really a pleasure to be here and, and speak to you guys today. The group that I'm with is the Whale Center of New England. We were founded in 1979 in Gloucester, Massachusetts, initially as the Cetacean Research Unit way back when of the Gloucester Fishermen's Museum. Um, and our mission is three-pronged, to study whales and the marine environment, to conserve them because they are endangered, and to educate people about them. And, and the three missions all tie together. But what I'm going to talk about today is just our studies of humpback whales. And humpbacks have sort of been our bread and butter ever since we got started. And I think, for those of you who attend the other Lowell lectures, and it's a really impressive lecture series. I know I'm planning on coming to most of them myself because there's some great speakers who've worked in some great exotic locations and, and done and seen some amazing things. Somehow thinking about whales in your own backyard is not quite as exotic. But I do think it's pretty amazing to think that literally, sometimes within the site of Boston, is a population of an endangered species that has become one of the best understood populations of baleen whales in the world. And that's thanks in part to some of the whale watching that's gone on and the de dedicated work of a lot of people. The story that I tell you today is a story that is in a small part mine, in a slightly larger part the staff of the Whale Center of New England over 25 years, and this is our 25th anniversary year, we're really proud of that. But it goes way beyond that as well. Whenever you work with a large animal like a baleen whale that covers huge distances, it is by nature, if you're going to understand the animal, a collaborative process. And we're fortunate to work with some wonderful people at groups like the Center for Coastal Studies, Allied Whale, the College of the Atlantic, um, the Stellwag and Bank National Marine Sanctuary, the New England Aquarium, um, Blue Ocean, the Brower Island Whale and Seabird Cruise Group, and the Center for Oceanic Research and Education all of whom have contributed to the story that I'm going to tell you today. And without any of these, pieces would be missing in a big way. The critter that we're going to be discussing is the humpback whale. Probably most of you have seen a humpback whale in life. They're typically 38 to 50 feet long. They weigh about 30 to 35 tons as adults. They are baleen whales, and they're grouped with them. And they're in the family Balaenoptera, Balaenopteridae, which is related to the blue fin, say, and minke whales, although they're a separate genus off of that. They're a sort of slightly unique beast. They're not the prettiest of all the whales, although they are a little bit prettier than right whales, which is the aquarium's flagship species, so they at least have that going for them. But there are several, several features which distinguish humpback whales from other whales. One, and probably the most prominent, are the long pectoral fins, which are typically a third the length of the animal's body. So in a full-grown adult, 16 or 17 feet long. There's a number of thoughts as to why humpback whales have come up with these long fins. The one that I sort of subscribe to is as a heat, a heat loss mechanism. Humpback whales go through greater temperature extremes in their migrations than any other mammal in the world. They're the only whale that migrates from true tropical to true polar waters, and they actually have the longest migration of any mammal. There's a population that lives in the southern hemisphere that summers off the Antarctic Peninsula. The winter is up to 10 degrees north of the equator, up to 6,000 miles each way. So they need a thick fat layer to stay warm when it's cold, and they also need a way to dump heat, more so than most other whales do. The flipper has a lot of surface area, but not a lot of thickness or volume to it. So by circulating blood to the flippers, they're able to dump heat when they need to. The other possibility is that they may give these animals a little bit of lift and maneuverability. It's the tail that propels the animal. The flippers are used primarily for steering, and recently it's been shown they can give the whale a lot of lift as well. Humpbacks tend to live in fairly shallow waters, usually less than about 100 meters deep. And so because they live in these shallow areas, these flippers may give them a little bit of maneuverability. The next thing that's unique to humpback whales is their stubby dorsal fin. They have a dorsal fin, but it's sort of a low and swept back dorsal fin. It's fairly important for us in ways I'll tell you about later. And it's from that dorsal fin that the humpback whale actually gets its name. The name humpback came from the old whalers. And nobody's quite sure whether it is for 
the hump that is in front of the dorsal fin or actually the way the whale humps its back up prominently exposing the dorsal fin when it dives. And then the last thing that they're, pro they're well known for are the wart-like bumps that are all over their snout that are called tubercles or, to the old whalers, stove bolts. Um, these are actually enlarged hair follicles, and they're actually pretty amazing organs. Each one of them, if you look at a humpback whale on the beach or very close up, has a single hair that protrudes from it. That's pretty well known by people. A couple of years ago, though, we actually did a little bit of work with some scientists at MIT on the structure of, of the stove bolt and, and to look at it. And what, we've, what was found was that in addition to the single hair that's on the tip of it, there's also a, a very dense layer of several hundred hairs that lie just below the skin. In addition to that, the nerve cell that comes off there going to the brain has the largest myelin sheath that has been described in any nerve cell anywhere in the world. That may be because of the length from the brain for that, for that hair. It may be because of the sensitivity of the hair. In any event, we think that that hair helps the whale detect motion in the water. It's a very sensitive mechanism that allows the animal to detect motion from the movements of fish, we'll say, which are the primary prey of humpback whales. Why humpbacks have these enlarged follicles as opposed to the other species, and all the species have hairs on their head, we really don't know, but it does seem to get that, that up and over there. This is what a humpback whale looks like in life. This is sort of an ideal view instead of the stylistic view. We're not all fortunate enough to have had this view of a humpback. And these are the more standard views of a humpback whale that are probably more familiar to you. The long flipper, the stubby dorsal fin, and the tubercles all over the snout. Humpback whales, as I said, are a migratory species. In the North Atlantic, they winter in two areas. They winter primarily in the Caribbean. Um, their primary breeding grounds is about halfway between the Turks and Caicos and the Dominican Republic in an area called Silver Bank. There are also surrounding banks, Virgin Bank, Mouchoir Bank, and so forth down there that provide, we think, shelter for females giving birth to calves and also are, are staging areas for males they're mating. Then in the spring, they migrate up to a series of different feeding areas, including ours in, in the New England or Gulf of Maine region, one that is sort of off of Newfoundland and Labrador, one off the mouth of the Gulf of St. Lawrence, one in Greenland, one in Iceland, and perhaps a couple of different ones off the Norwegian coast. Recent work has also shown that there may actually be one that is in the middle of the ocean that nobody has looked at before. An article was just published actually about three days ago that shows that whalers used to see humpbacks in the early summer right in the middle of the ocean all fairly commonly. And so we think there may be a group just on the west side of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, but that is, remains to be determined. Now, the, the way that these animals have set their social structure up Basically, a whale learns, it seems, the migration route to one of these different feeding areas. We call them feeding herds. And they learn that migration to one of these feeding herds when they are calves. So they breed in areas where males from essentially all over the ocean breed, but then they learn the migration route to one of these generalized feeding herds from their mother. And so what each one of these groups becomes is a series of matrilineal groups. So a New England humpback whale, even if we don't know its heritage, probably had a New England humpback whale as its mom. We have seen occasional movements between adjacent feeding herds, but it's pretty uncommon, and they usually stay right in their natal herd. Now, during the wintertime, as I said, they're in warm waters. That is their mating season. Pregnancy is about 12 months, so a female that mates one year will give birth to a calf the following year. Um, the calf at birth is 10 to 12 feet long and weighs approximately 2,000 pounds at birth. And the other reason probably for migrating down there is that it's easy to stay warm in the tropical seas. That's especially important, we think, for calves because calves are born with very thin fat layers. So to stay warm in these, in these cooler seas, even during the summer when it gets up to maybe 65 degrees, probably is not as easy as staying warm in the tropics where it's 75 to 80 degrees. That gives the calf a little bit of a chance to build up its fat layer, and it's been shown that a humpback calf gains about 60 to 70 pounds a day nursing from mom while they're down there. The problem with the tropics is that they're fairly unproductive for plankton life, which are the primary prey of the bait fish the whales feed on, and so they seasonally fast, going three to four months without eating, adults losing 10 to 14,000 pounds before they get back here. And in fact, when you see them come back up in the spring, they look noticeably thinner. If you know how to look at a humpback whale, you'll see a big concavity on the back where that fat layer has been used up through that long fast. And over the season, you'll see them kind of round out on the back until they leave again in the fall. 
Now, within each one of these feeding herds or feeding areas, there are what I call several neighborhoods. In the New England one, there are four of these neighborhoods that we've recognized. One is down here in the Great South Channel on, on the southwestern side of George's Bank. Another one is in the Stellwagen Bank, southern Jeffreys Ledge area. Another one, northern Jeffreys Ledge and some of the nearby offshore banks like Platts Bank, Cash's Ledge, Fiffany's Ledge. And then another one up on, off of Nova Scotia and in the Bay of Fundy. Now, neighborhoods are a little bit different than feeding herds. Feeding herds seem to be relatively discreet. Neighborhoods are not as discreet. Whales will move between adjacent neighborhoods, certainly, and can move within any of these different neighborhoods. But each whale seems to develop a preference area for particular neighborhoods. And an, an analogy that I use commonly is how you are if you're in your neighborhood and need to get something like a gallon of milk. Without thinking about it, you know exactly what store to go to, exactly what to do, and if you think about it about a half hour later, you probably can't even remember your trip to the grocery store. If I were, on the other hand, to place you in my hometown of Gloucester if you'd never been there before, you could probably find your gallon of milk. You'd have to work at it a little bit harder, but you'd come home with a gallon of milk, maybe with a little bit more work and a little bit more stress. I think the same thing is true of humpback whales. I think that they will return to their neighborhood of preference because they know the microhabitats that are likely to be areas where they're going to find their prey. They're areas that they have experience in over years and can really find things fairly easily. However, if their store is out of milk, if there's no prey for them in their neighborhood, they will move to a close-by neighborhood and may have to work a little bit harder but will be able to find their prey. Individual whales also have different amounts that they will be faithful to their neighborhood. Even though, for instance, Southern Jeffreys Ledge and Northern Jeffreys Ledge are literally within miles of each other, there are certain individual whales that we've never seen cross that boundary in 25 years. On the other hand, there are other individuals that can move back and forth within there in a matter of days. So it seems to be very, very variable by individual as well. But clearly, there are regional habitat preferences. And again, within each neighborhood, there are these geological features that really attract whales and allow them productivity. This one is one that you're probably all familiar with. This is Stellwagen Bank and Southern Jeffreys Ledge, the border of the Stellwagen National Marine Sanctuary around there. And you can see just by looking at, at the, the shallow areas are in green, the deeper areas in blue, and you can see the areas of really high relief. Those areas of high relief create upwelling, as you probably know, a lot of turnover in the water column, which generates tremendous productivity that brings in the kind of prey that whales and lots of other marine predators feed on. So, if a whale, for instance, is at the southern end of Stellwagen Bank, isn't finding prey there, they know that that huge area at northern Stellwagen, where there's a lot of relief, especially on the western side, can be a very productive area. They will move in there and back and forth first before they leave that neighborhood and go to a full adjacent neighborhood where they're not as familiar with these little microhabitats that occur throughout the, that, that particular basin. By the way, I should also say, if there's any questions on anything I say during the course of the presentation, we don't necessarily have to hold them to the end. Yes? Question: You talked about um, whales being uh, sticking to their own feeding groups. What about mating? They they do mate between feeding herds. We think they mate in in feeding in breeding areas where males from certainly at least fifty or sixty percent of the feeding uh, feeding herds, if not all of them, go down to. And while genetic work is just starting to illuminate whose father is whose, it's pretty large populations so that takes a lot of work to do. Certainly, males from different feeding herds have been seen in the same com competitive groups trying to breed with, with breeding females. So we do think that, that pr it's pretty much a panmictic mating situation. Now, it's also true, if, if I were to go back um, to, that, to that chart of, of migration, you can see there's also a secondary breeding ground in the Cape Verde Islands. And there's some thought that the Cape Verdes and possibly the eastern side of the Caribbean may be more tied to the eastern Atlantic feeding populations, the Norwegian and Icelandic groups, they may go down there um, and not occur in the Caribbean as much. But Norwegian animals have been matched to the Caribbean, so we know that there's at least some interchange in there. Okay. In the 
neighborhood that we work on here, humpback whales are primarily fish feeders. Now, humpbacks and most baleen whales, to some extent, will vary their diet depending on where they are. There are exceptions to that. Right whales are something of an exception. Blue whales may be something of an exception as well. But humpbacks in the North Atlantic seem to feed 95% or so on, on fish. Um, I'll give you a little bit of an exception to that later on. In the neighborhoods around New England, the primary prey are two fish. Um, on Stellwag and Bank, the primary prey are these small fish called sand lance or sand eels that you've probably heard about that fluctuate greatly. They're eel-like in shape, even though they are not eels at all. They're true bony fish. Um, bottom dwellers during the night and in times of low density will sometimes school together and come up in the water column. And in fact, you can see a couple of sand lance just in the mouth of this feeding whale. The other important prey in our area is herring. Herring are more prevalent on Jeffrey's Ledge than they are on Stellwag and Bank, and they sometimes will act as a nice counterbalance. Some of the time when sand lands populations are down, humpbacks will shift and feed on herring, um, and so forth. There are also differences in how different age classes and even perhaps different sexes can, can use these prey as well. Our effort started in 1979, and it, co it collaborated with the start of whale watching out of Gloucester, Massachusetts. Whale watching in general on the East Coast started only in 1976, less than 30 years ago, which is kind of hard to believe given the size of the whale watch industry off of New England right now, but it's a relatively novel industry. When a small boater who used to take people out to watch fishermen haul their nets and noticed that their people were paying more attention to the whales than the fishermen, started to do whale watch, and they collaborated with the Gloucester Fishermen's Museum and set up what was then the Cetacean Research Unit, just to see sort of which whales were there and what basic use was. We've since expanded. We got our own research boat first in 1984. We've had one since then. Currently, we, we staff several different whale watch boats out of different ports as both part of our education mission, but also as a way to gather data. We also run and operate our own research boat, and now, for some of our dedicated studies, even charter some of the larger boats for, for our own work. The first thing that we did, though, was just to try and study the behavior of humpback whales and understand what they did, because relatively little was known about that on the feeding grounds. So the first thing we tried to do was come up with an ethogram or a catalog of different behaviors, and we came up with, it's now about 82 different behaviors that are broken into five basic categories of things that whales do. And I figured I would start by just going over what occurs in the life of a humpback whale up here. One of the most prominent ones you see are behaviors that are done with the flippers or flukes. The most common one is just diving behavior. That's the time when the fluke is normally exposed. It's something that is seen generally in whales that are buoyant. Humpbacks, as I mentioned, have a fairly thick fat layer, and so to dive, they seem to have to arch and, and dive on a steep angle. Some of the thinner whales that are less buoyant, like minke whales or say whales or fin whales, don't do that because they are, are negatively buoyant and can sink very easily. But the more buoyant humpbacks or right whales or sperm whales or gray whales, when they dive, seem to have to often dive on a steep angle so their tail gets exposed. Relatively unexciting behavior. However, they can do other things with the flippers and flukes as well. Whales, in general, live in a world of sound. You probably have heard of the humpback whale song. It's one of the most famous sounds made anywhere in nature. And in general, whales do experience their world as a world of sound. I'll mention humpback whale song briefly in, in just a little bit. But realize that vision for these animals is limited, certainly, by the visibility of the water. If there's so much plankton in the waters of New England, visibility is more than 10 or 15 feet. Anyone who's tried to dive out here knows that. There's nothing that a whale's eye can do, no matter how well it's developed, that can get around that. And so they live in a world of sound. They don't produce sonar, as far as we know, only the toothed whales and dolphins do. So they have to rely on both sounds other whales make, sounds they make, and also ambient sounds as well. And one way they have of communicating is by making sounds with their body, with their flippers or tails. These generally are fairly emphatic sounds that go a long ways. And the work we've done sort of indicates they're not very friendly sounds. When adult whales do this, it's usually indicating to another animal something along the lines of, watch out, here I come, and I don't particularly want to do anything with you, or I've been with you for a while, I'm, there's not enough food here for both of us, I'm going to leave here, don't follow me, something like that. You see it very often associated with either splits or joins, or times when whales are coming into or leaving areas that other whales are in. Probably the most prominent way that you see a whale do something like this is the breach. Breaching, again, is used to make sounds in a social context. It seems to be a more emphatic way of doing it than either the lob tails or flipper slaps. Um, it can also be play behavior, we think, in calves, and they also have a contact function in calves as well. Often when mothers and calves are separated, as will sometimes happen when a mother is feeding, the calf will start to do these behaviors, breaching, lobtailing, flipper slapping. That may just be stress on the part of the calf because it's away from its mom, 
but it may also be a locator for the mom so that it can keep track of where its calf is and rejoin it after it's done with, it, with its feeding valve. We actually recorded six different kinds of breaches. They seem to just to sort of have different levels of energy and different levels of emphasis in the sound the animal makes. And in fact, often in, in aerial displays, you'll see animals start with these very emphatic displays with extremely hard breaches that will then turn to lobtails, flipper slaps, lower breaches before waning. And we think that that's just sort of as the motivation of the animal wanes, so too does the amount of energy it uses in its behavior wane. <coughs> Resting is another thing that whales do. All whales, all animals do have to rest. Whales do as well. And resting in humpback whales will often be a behavior called logging, where the animal is pretty much motionless at the surface. It can also be a slow traveling behavior. But one of the, the tricks about resting in whales in most cetaceans is that breathing is voluntary, so they don't have a breathing reflex when they're on a dive. The best thing that we know about, about resting in cetaceans is some really elaborate work that was done on captive dolphins where they monitored the electroencephalograms of the dolphins, and they showed that there were times where dolphins would actually sleep with one side of the brain at a time. Waterfowl do the same kind of thing. And while they did that, the swimming velocity of the dolphin went down, but it still moved forward. Well, we think that resting in humpbacks also occurs in these, these patterns where the animal is sometimes motionless at the surface, sometimes moving slowly forward, usually 20 to 30 minutes at a time. Curious and inquisitive behavior is another thing that we've seen whales do. Um, probably the time that most people have seen this is with a close approach to boats, but boats are just one of the things they close approach. They love seaweed. Whales love to play in patches of kelp. They'll drape it on their backs, over their snouts. We've seen whales playing with sticks, with logs, with debris, with buoys, with raincoats, all kinds of different things. That inquisitive behavior is usually seen from calves and juvenile animals and appears to be very much personality related. There's some individuals that just seem to be very curious about their environment. But in, even in those animals, as the animal approaches maturity, six, seven, eight years of age, that behavior tends to fade away. Although sometimes in those animals, you'll still see it recur a little bit. And they'll still decide to either come over to a boat briefly, although nowhere for near as long as they did as a juvenile animal, um, just to kind of ha sort of see what's going on. In general, the bouts from juvenile animals are much longer than the adults, as I said, and much more frequent. But again, that reflects the different amount of energy that's involved in, in juvenile or calf life versus adult life. But probably the most important thing that humpback whales do on their feeding grounds is feed. And humpbacks have come up with a number of ways of doing that in order to get the amount of prey they need. And they have to do that because they need a tremendous amount of prey. Now, it's one thing to just imagine how much prey a humpback whale needs, but we actually, a number of years ago, tried to quantify that a little bit. We collected prey contents from a 47-foot male humpback that stranded in 1987. The prey that was found in the animal's stomach was mackerel. It was actually mackerel bones. The animal had been feeding on mackerel. And we collected 200 pounds, plus or minus 10% wet weight, of mackerel bones. Now, I think this study is a pretty important one, too, because a lot of people look at people who work with whales and think, geez, it must be great to be out there in the field and looking at whales breaching and, and you know, w looking at them feeding and so forth. This is sort of the other side of whale research. The 200 pounds, plus or minus 10%, is because we did get in the body bags, the five body bags, the 200 pounds of mackerel remains takes up some stomach fluids. And the minus is because even we have some limits as to how far inside a carcass we will crawl for every last mackerel bone. But the other thing that was sort of a bonus in this animal was that there was actually a reasonably intact mackerel that was in the, lodged in the animal's throat that was 15 and a quarter inches long. Now, as many of you probably know, fish have a bone called an otolith, which will, can tell you the age of the, of the fish. So we extracted the otolith from that 15 and a quarter inch mackerel, and then looked for otoliths in that 200 pounds. We only went through about one and a half body bags of the five body bags to make sure that all the, the mackerel that this whale was feeding on were of about the same size. That seemed to work pretty well. They were monoculture and fish generally occur in, in age class like school. So we assumed that this animal was feeding on mackerel that were 15 and a quarter inches. Well, we're based in Gloucester. Gloucester is a big seafood town. So it was pretty easy to go to a local seafood distributor then and ask them if they had any mackerel in there. They did. We asked them if we could see their stock. They showed it to us. We went there with our tape measure and started to measure mackerel until we found a number of mackerel that were 15 and a quarter inches long. We then asked them if they could fillet the mackerel down just to the skeleton. We weighed them first. And what we found was that the skeleton of a 15 and a quarter inch mackerel weighs about 0.11 pounds. 
We also found that the actual fish weighs 1.37 pounds on average, plus or minus 0.1 pounds. So if you do a little bit of math, 200 pounds of bones represents 1,818 pounds of mackerel. If you then do the caloric conversion, where one pound of whole mackerel equals 470 calories, and I got to tell you, why on a human caloric conversion chart they would have one pound of whole mackerel, I don't know, but it was very easy to find. In any event, it meant that Comet's last meal of 1,818 pounds was 854,500 calories. That means, if you calculate it out, that a whale feeds approximately twice a day, and we have some reasons to think that that's true, and the residency on the feeding grounds is from May 1st to November 15th, which is conservative on both sides, the daily consumption of the animal is about 1,700,000 calories, and the total consumption per whale is about 338 million calories from the New England ecosystem. This is put up there for two reasons. First of all, since this is a brown bag session, it makes you not feel as bad about that piece of cake you just ate. It's nothing in the grand scheme of things. The second thing, though, is that when you're modeling the ecosystem of New England or any area, to leave out something like this would be catastrophically incorrect. Yet if you look at most of the fisheries models that the government works on, there is nothing in there for marine mammal consumption, which is just amazing to me to think you can model the ecosystem that way. So our whale needs 1,700,000 calories per day. That's a lot of prey. And so they have to come up with some pretty good ways of finding their prey and capturing the prey. We also have to come up with some good ways, if we can understand these whales, of studying the relationship of whales and their prey. And so we get to use some electronics to do it. This is the nice, neat, fancy echo sounder that, that we sometimes use. This is a reading taken in 187 feet of water. The target that you see actually low near the bottom there is a humpback whale mother calf pair. The calf just up on top of the mom, most likely. And you can see that there's not a lot of prey in that water column. It's just the target of the two of them below the boat. So we can determine something about whether or not the animal is likely to, to stay there, whether the prey is in the middle of the water column or, or low, if there's any prey there, and so forth. That's a nice, pretty version we like to show people, but that's not, not actually the version we really can use. This is the version that we can use. Nowhere near as pretty, but much more informative. First of all, it's on a piece of paper, so we can take it home and record it that way. But what you're looking at here is the surface to about 110 feet down. This is in the shallow waters of Stellwagen Bank. The black traces that you see are prey. They're actually schools most likely of sand eels. The vertical marks that say two and three are marks that we record on there every 10 minutes. And what we end up doing then is to place a grid over this calculate the amount of time between those two marks, grid this out into each 10 feet of the water column, and record the amount of prey that is there in each 10 feet of the water column to see what these animals are making their decision on. So we can actually look, while recording the behavior of whales, respiration rates, and, and surface behavior of whales, we can see what is going on in their underwater environment as well. This, by the way, up here are two humpback whale bubble clouds. I'll talk about those in a second. And so this is an area where there's obviously a fair amount of prey. There actually are feeding humpbacks in and around this. And so we can use this data to look at decision making in whales. When whales decide to feed versus not feed. When they decide to stay in an area for several days versus leave and forage for another area. And again, without looking at some of these underwater things, there's just no way to see what's going on in the whale's world. It has limitations, certainly, but it's a way of getting some insight. Now, humpbacks feed in a number of ways. One way is just by taking water in, in their mouth and filtering it out. I'm assuming that you guys all know what a baleen whale is, so I'm not going to talk about the filtration process. But we do sometimes see whales that are deep feeding that just come up with their mouths full of water and food and are filtering like that. Very common from juvenile whales. Juveniles don't seem to have learned some of the strategies that some of the more complex adults know. One simple way that whales have of, of increasing their prey, though, is to feed cooperatively, coming up in groups with other whales. We think that this basically is, is allowing the whales to collaborate in chasing fish from mouths of one to the other. As they come up from below their fish school, fish can only swim sideways, they can't go up or down. And so each whale is having fish that are leaving the mouth of the previous whale coming right into that. The limitation here, though, is that if you go back to the thought that each whale needs 1,700,000 calories, to get a group of six whales like that or 14 whales like that, you can just think about the caloric need of that group. That can only occur at times when the prey is extremely dense. So humpback whales use bubbles. Bubbles are a really great thing if you're feeding on fish, because fish can't go through air. It just upsets their swim bladder, and they can't swim. So bubbles effectively trap fish. 
and whales will blow bubbles to trap their fish. Scared fish schools also clump together, giving the whale a concentrated source of prey. And so the bubbles probably do that as well, and they may even push the prey up to the surface. And after the bubbles come up, about 20 seconds later, the whale often follows it, feeding near the surface. Now, they use several different bubble structures, probably the most famous of which are bubble nets, which are intricate structures blown from the blowholes where the whale swims in a spiral, probably an upward spiral, trapping the fish in the center of the school. Very common in the North Pacific, less common in the Atlantic, although we do see some animals that do that. More common for our whales are bubble clouds, much less intricate structures, but there are these patches of bubbles that are 20 to 30 feet across, and they're made up of very tiny little bubbles within there. We think that they may be released actually through the animal's mouth. Now, the whale can't breathe through its mouth. It can only breathe through its nostrils. But they can dump their trachea into their mouth. And so we think what the whales are actually doing is to open their trachea, dump the air into the mouth, open the mouth a tiny little bit, which releases it through the baleen, which breaks the air up into a series of tiny little bubbles. Because although the patch of bubbles is about 30 feet across, each bubble is a little bit less than an inch. And so we think that what that does is to surround the fish school, capture it there. Sand lance are a very weak swimming fish. It probably brings them up as well as traps the fish there and allows the whales to come through there. It's really important that the bubble cloud be broken up that way. Because if you think about it, if the whale were to release air through the blowholes, through the nostril, it comes out as a single burst of air. That comes up as a bubble which actually has the effect of taking the, pit, the fish and pushing it off to the side of the bubble, which doesn't concentrate it at all for the whale. Instead, it needs to break it up to keep the fish inside there and essentially mass them there, push them up, scare them, group them together, and the whale can trap its fish up near the surface. We've also seen whales develop a new behavior called lobtail feeding, which is a twist on bubble feeding. What the whale does here is to hit the surface of the water as it's going down with its tail, which it will then follow with a bubble cloud and then a feeding lunge. The tail slap may disorient the fish. It may mark the spot for the whale where the fish is. It may help to concentrate the prey together before the whale gets below it. We're not sure which it really does. But we've watched this behavior develop quite a bit through the 1980s. When we started in our first year out here, we didn't even see a single whale that did this. And yet by the end of the 1980s, over 50% of, of the whales were doing it. And you can see the trend line going up. It is leveled off at about 60% of our whales now that do this lobtail feeding. So we wanted to look and see, OK, if a behavior like this develops, how does it develop? Do old dogs learn new tricks? Or is it young whales that are developing this technique? Well, we figured that it took us about three years to photograph most of the existing population. So we broke our data up into two groups, those whales seen in the first three years, those seen after. The second assumption we made, and there's good reason to think that this is true, is that a whale that is seen lobtail feeding uses it, that lobtail feeding as its primary feeding style. So when we looked at the data, what we found was that the whales that were seen in the first three years had about 80 animals that have, are not lobtail feeders, have never been seen to lobtail feed, and several animals that did, about 12. And if you look in the group that is post-1982, which we're saying is a lot of younger whales born since the, that first three years, although certainly it includes some animals that were alive in that period as well, you can see in the second group there are more whales that lobtail feed than don't. So what can we conclude from this? One, that young whales are developing the technique. In fact, they're developing it between one and three years old, our behavioral work says. Second, the transmission of the behavior was cultural. We know that because a lot of these whales in the post-1982 group have moms that are in the pre-1982 group that have never been seen to lobtail feed. Yet they're picking up lobtail feeding on their own. And the transmission there has to be by observing other animals in, in the environment. And that's one of the reasons why we think that the rate accelerated as certain animals started to do it. There were more models for other younger animals who were watching these older animals, trying it experientially, and so forth. And in fact, Culture seems to be a very important part of humpback whale society. A couple of other things to show that. Humpback whale song. Humpback whale song is sung by males on the breeding grounds around the world, and it seems to be a breeding display. Well, a couple of years ago in Australia, a researcher named Mike Node found something really interesting. There are two humpback whale groups in Australia. There's a group that comes up the east side, a group that comes up the west side. And the groups are very distinct. They don't seem to intermix at all. And each group has a different song. 
Well, Mike was, had an offshore hydrophone, and he was monitoring songs as the animals were migrating by. And in the spring of one year, he all of a sudden, on the east side of Australia, heard a West Australia song. Just heard it once. By the time those whales were migrating south later that year, he heard it about 10% of the time. By the time they were migrating north the following spring, they were hearing it about 50% of the time. By the time it went south, it was 75% of the time. And within two years, the Western song had replaced the Eastern song. That can only occur through culture, through listening and learning. We're also seeing a new example of cultural learning right now, it looks like, off of New England. The past several falls, for some reason, young whales have shown up and started to feed, we think, on plankton. We can't find any traces of any fish sources where they're feeding. And that slide I showed you before of a whale just coming up and filtering is what these whales are doing every surfacing. Their dives are short, they're 90 seconds, they're just feeding again and again and again. Our plankton toes there show only amphipods as the possible food source. No copepods, very sparse krill, but rich amphipods. And so we think that some juvenile animals may have found a, a bloom of amphipods that occurs in the fall close to shore off of the northern New England coast. And the same whales are starting to show up year after year to exploit that amphipod source. By the time they hit adulthood, they're starting to trail off, but other young animals are starting to do as well. They're learning it, and other animals are learning it from them. We're going to be working that data up in the next year or two, but it looks like it's a new example of culture that's going on right off our coast. In, fa in fact, right now, because it's a fall thing. And one last thing before I, fe before I leave feeding, which I think is a really cool thing about humpback whales, and it just goes to show how well-developed these animals are for their environment. Humpback whales, when they feed, have a jaw which dislocates, and it does some pretty amazing things. This is a slide of a humpback whale with its mouth closed. You can see that the lower jaw goes about six inches past the upper jaw, but it fits pretty well. If you look at the same animal when it's feeding, you can see the tip of the upper jaw, which is right here, and the tip of the lower jaw, which is right here. Basically, as these whales feed, because they need such huge quantities of prey, as gulp feeders, they're taking in up to 1,000 gallons of water per mouthful. That's a tremendous weight. And if they were to have a jaw joint that was like ours, which is locked, that jaw would risk breaking. So instead, their jaw is very loose. And when they feed, that lower jaw can come up to 36 inches out of its socket. They don't voluntarily push it forward. It's just the weight of the water that pulls it out. Then the tendons at that jaw joint can actually pull that back in. And by doing that, by expanding that up to a yard forward, the animal increases the, body, the volume of the pouch that it feeds with by about a third. So not only are they behaviorally adept at what they're doing, evolutionarily they're, they're really perfectly adapted to feeding this way as well. Are there any questions on feeding stuff before I go on? OK. Another great thing about humpback whales that makes them very convenient study animals is that they can be easily, relatively easily identified as, as individuals. They don't, they, they will sometimes change, as I'll show you in a little bit, but they have a number of features which are really distinctive on them. Some other species like finback whales or say whales or minke whales are much less distinct. Some other animals like right whales have inconvenient things that move around on their head where they have their distinctive marks. They're all, I think at least, a lot tougher to identify than humpback whales are. I don't know if Beth would agree or not, but in any event, the first thing that we can use to identify humpbacks are dorsal fins. You see the dorsal fin on every surfacing the whale creates. And you can see by these three animals down here how different the different dorsal fins are, ranging from hooked to squared to nicked and so forth. However, they're not as variable as the patterns on the underside of a humpback whale's tail. Now, the general dogma that you will hear is that these animals are born with these patterns here. They stay there throughout life, and they're easily identifiable. Once they hit about four or five years old, I'd agree with that. But the more we match these animals, the more problems we're finding with flukes. For instance, let's look at the whale named Lighthouse, born in 2000, the calf of a female named Trida. When Lighthouse was two years old and returned, you can see that some of the distinctive marks are still there, but the tail has darkened considerably. Some new marks have come in. This big line down there has extended from over there. The actual lighthouse itself is still visible, but black is encroaching in on it. The following year, Lighthouse died, and this is what his fluke looked like. Now, if you look at that carefully, and the light isn't great here, but you can still make out a few of the marks. You also have this ridge pattern up top, which actually makes the match fairly easy. 
but it shows that the pigment has changed totally from the time it was a calf to the time it was a three-year-old. Another example, the whale named Beanie, named for this mark over on the left side of the tail that looks like little, you know, Cecil, Be remember Beanie and Cecil, little, little whirly thing there. You can still see the Beanie in 2001, but again, the black is starting to expand a little bit. 2002, the Beanie is still there, just barely, a lot more black. And in 2003, now, again, if the light was right, you could just make out a very thin trace of this line here, but it's really disappeared for the most part. Once they do hit about five years old, it seems to solidify. But what we're really finding is that to go from calf year to near maturity, you can almost not rely on pigment in these animals at all. However, you can learn some really dramatic things from photo identification, um, especially again through collaborative studies. And right now, the College of Atlantic in Bar Harbor, Maine, has a catalog of over 5,000 humpback whales on file in the North Atlantic. That's how you put together stories like the different feeding herds and the common, common breeding ground. It's through the work of a lot of people through a collaborative agency. You can also learn things like population dynamics, return rates, residency times, calving rates. We now know that humpbacks have calves once every two to four years. Calf survival, to look at how often they return. And social dynamics and the rules of society. You can also even develop matrilineal trees. And eventually, once you use molecular genetics, even possibly paternal trees as well. This particular matrilineal tree is a tree of a female named Tiger. It is, as far as I know, the first fourth generation tree of any baleen whale in the world. Tiger was first photographed in 79. Her first calf named Batik, first born in 1983, had her first calf when she was six in 1989. That's filament below her. And then Eden was born to filament when filament was 11. And so again, you can start to develop these and trace these things. We're also using new techniques to help us study humpback whales as well, and there's some really exciting things that we can learn from them. One is from biopsy sampling. Biopsy sampling involves taking a small skin and blubber sample from the whale, fired from a crossbow using a small metal dart. This is the dart itself. The dart is about an inch long. It's about a half an inch in diameter. Um, the foam that you see around the base of it is a little collar that helps the, the dart float. It's fired from a crossbow. The top of the dart is hollowed out. The force from the cross causes a penetration through the skin into the blubber. And then on the inside of the dart, a backward pointing fish hook or downward pointing barbs grab on the underside of the skin as a recoil starts and it takes out that little skin and blubber sample. What can we learn? Well, the easy thing is in molecular genetics. We can learn how whale populations are related to each other around the world. We can learn what the mating system is. Do females mate with the same male more than once? We can learn which whales are related to each other in the society and how closely related they are on average. And most importantly, perhaps, we can learn whether or not whales lost genetic diversity during whaling. With humpbacks, it looks like we've got a very robust genetic system. On the other hand, with some species like right whales in the North Atlantic, some of the work right here at this institution has shown that that's not the case, and they have lost quite a bit. And so that represents another thing you have to deal with in managing the species for recovery. But we can learn more. We can use blubber to look at lifetime toxin burdens in these animals and determine how much of, of a problem that is. We can use blubber to look at recent toxin exposure using cytochrome P450. We can look at diet using stable isotopes in the skin. And now we're also trying to work on a technique using <coughs> skin to age these animals and figure out something about how long they live and how, how different animals are sort of related to each other in terms of age structure. Tagging is another thing that, that we've been working on. Now, there's two kinds of tags. One are long-term tags, satellite tags, um, which track animals for a long period of time. Those have not been used very much on humpback whales in New England, um, but they have been used on humpbacks in other areas. The primary person doing this is Dr. Bruce Mate. He put a tag on, on several North Pacific humpbacks and found, again, some very surprising things. One of his tracks is over there on the left. We've known for years that humpback whales migrate from Hawaii to, to southeast Alaska. But what we didn't know is that sometimes they go up to southeast Alaska, take a hard left turn, and go all the way over to Russia on their migration. And those are the things that you can find by following animals for long periods of time. What we've been more involved with is short-term tagging, using something called the D-tag, developed by Peter Tyak at Woods, Woods Hole on his team. The D-tag, which stands for digital tag, records behavior continuously. 
as the animal dies. It records the pitch and roll of the animal, the velocity of it, and basically what it does is gives you a second-by-second -second picture of what the whale is doing below the surface. It's a section cup tag that is designed to stay on for less than 24 hours, usually attached by a large pole. You can see it sitting on a humpback whale down below there. You can certainly come up very easily with, with tag records like that, which are dive profiles, but the thing that I think is more exciting is the one below it, which is a three-dimensional picture of what that whale was doing in a spatial structure during the time it had the tag on. That's just an hour's worth of tagging. Now there's been a new computer model that's developed that will actually allow you to visualize exactly what the animal is doing in its habitat. It, the tag also records sounds that the animal makes and sounds the animal hears. So you can, in addition to seeing what the animal is doing, understand what's going on in the acoustic world of the animal. We've been working on this with Dr. David Wiley from the Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary for several years now. We did a pilot program in 2002 and a much longer, more developed program this year where we got 50 hours of data on, I believe it's actually six whales, not five that are in there. Got some detailed data, which we're working up now on bottom feeding, midwater resting, and long range travel. One whale, in fact, even moved 90 miles in 21 hours while it had the tag on. And we can also, hopefully, use this to examine a very important question for management of whales in New England, which is how they react to all those boats that are out there. Because we work on an endangered species, I couldn't leave this talk without telling you a little bit about threats to humpbacks and the status of humpbacks. I know you hear a lot about this with right whales, but humpbacks are not quite saved yet either. They are recovering. They currently number about 10,500 in the North Atlantic and probably about 30,000 worldwide. The number in the New England feeding population is imprecise, but probably about 1,000 animals. That 1,000 represented an increase through the 1980s and really zero growth since the early 1990s. We've had some time where there's been very low calf survivals. We've had a couple of mortalities, which I'll t tell you about in just a little bit. And as far as we can tell, the New England population has been stable since about 1992-93. Threats to, to humpback whales. Well, the one that got them where they are was certainly whaling. Humpbacks were killed by the modern whaling era starting about 1900. 200,000 have been killed in the last 100 years. They were officially protected in 1963. We now know that in the 10 years following protection, because they were too endangered, the Soviet Union killed an additional 47,000. Now, I fear that whaling once again looms on the horizon as a problem for these animals. Certainly not in the North Atlantic, not close to us. I wouldn't rule Iceland out. But Japan has been trying to make a case at the International Whaling Commission repeatedly in the past several years that one of the populations of humpbacks in the Southern Hemisphere, the Area 5 population, for those who know about humpback whales, is growing exponentially and now numbers 30,000 animals. They've also made, which to me is even more dangerous, the case that minke whales are declining because the humpbacks are outcompeting them and forcing them into the ice, which seems to me to be setting up the case for Japan to say that they need to start sampling these animals for whale research, which is the other case for killing whales, which they've been doing with minke whales in years. So I would not be too surprised to see this coming on the horizon, and it's something we need to be vigilant about. More immediate threats to whales, certainly human disturbance. Any of you who have been out on Stellwag and Bank on a busy Saturday or Sunday know that our whales are urban whales, and they face the same stresses that any of us do driving in and out of a serious rush hour. Sound going around, the boats whizzing by them. And that can both have short-term behavioral effects, possibly, although certainly there's no indication to this point that's had chronic effects to whales. My big concern, though, is what the long-term effects on these animals' hearing is. The repeated approaches and leaves of boats, especially as they remain tolerant to them, can have a long-term impact on hearing, um, resulting in permanent threshold shifts. Whales rely on their hearing. So by having these animals return to these areas year after year after year, those animals that live in the Stellwagen Bank and Southern Jeffreys Ledge neighborhood, what are we doing to their hearing through these repeated approaches and repeated leaves? And when you see boats especially taking off, I mean, they're usually pretty good about approaching slowly. But unfortunately, when they're done with the whales, they often turn and just put the engine in gear and go. And that's got to be very loud for these animals. Entanglements are certainly a big threat. Work at the Center for Coastal Studies has shown that more than 60% of humpback whales have entanglement scars, and up to 20% encounter gear each year. This is a series of, of entanglements, um, an animal that swam into an active gillnet that was fishing for sand sharks, an animal with a loop of line around its tail, and another one actually from the Sea of Cortez with a loop of line around its tail as well. Some of the time, you can free whales from those entanglements, and some of the time, they free themselves. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're free. This is a whale named Tiara, who was in, had a necklace of line around its tail from 1986 through 1990. 
That dug through the tail a little bit and ended up with two fairly large welts at the base of the tail. But somehow that line slipped off after four years. Two years later, the flukes of tiara started to curve up a little bit. And then over the next year, the whole tail rotated. And so what you're looking at here is a fluke which is now rotated so that it is vertical on the animal. And after seven years of being that way, the blades are now starting to cup over once again. So this animal has survived to this point. But the other thing is, based on the pressure of swimming, there's this little hole right here that is starting to develop through the fluke that may eventually take that fluke blade off. And this is, again, 10, 11 years now after that animal has been freed. Another example, this is the whale named Venus. Now, we never saw Venus actually entangled. But you can see at the base of the tail, scar tissue there and indentations on both sides, which to us indicate entanglement. This is Venus the following year. And actually, when the animal just returned from migration, it still had all of its right tail. The left tail had sort of fallen off, and we watched that fall off in about the middle of August. And then this is that animal the following year, where the tail is essentially degraded. I'm sorry for those of you who can't see that. It's a little bit tough to see down there. But essentially, the tail is gone, except for just some fibrous tissue on the fluke. This is all hanging tissue that's rotting off there. And then that is probably the base of the spinal column. Needless to say, we didn't see this animal after that. There are some, yeah? Do you have high hopes for the new, heavier lines of Ushimera um, Some, and I'm actually just getting to that right here. <laughs> So what are the solutions to entanglement? Um, there are several. The first is a stopgap solution, which is disentangling entangled whales when, when they're seen. Um, that's a very difficult procedure. It is a life-threatening procedure in many cases to researchers. You don't know what the reactions of the animals are going to be. And while the Center for Coastal Studies has done a great job developing a network up and down the coast that has worked to disentangle numerous whales, these guys are putting their lives on the line every time they go out and, and deal with one of these animals. But really, the solutions have to be more in this area up here, which are, is gear modification. We have to come up with ways that fishermen can continue to fish and whales can continue to survive, whether those are weak links that the animal can break through easily without carrying line with it, whether it is sinking ground line that gets line out of the water column, and possibly solutions that we haven't come up with yet, biodegradable line. Um, line that, that may be more visible or more acoustically notable to whales. All those things are possible that we have to explore. But I think these solutions are attainable, and I think we have to attain them, given the rate at which we're seeing these whales entangled. You hear about ship collisions with right whales, certainly, but right whales are not the only ones that suffer ship collisions. And in fact, the major shipping lane between New York and Boston runs right through Stellwagen and Bank. I've necropsied several humpbacks that have had shattered skulls, shattered jaws, and so forth. And in fact, you can see other animals that are hit by smaller boats. These whales survived, but you can see this animal lost its dorsal fin. That's a juvenile humpback. The one on, on the far left there, you can see right into the blubber of the animal. And we watched that animal get that, that strike was in the early 1990s. I don't know if that animal made it or not. It made it for two years after the strike, but we haven't seen it now in over 10 years. What are the solutions for ship collisions? Well, they're tougher. The shippers say all we have to do, or one primary way of doing it, is to make mariners aware, aware of whales so they know where they are and can avoid them. It may be more feasible to separate ships from whales and route ships around whales. And where we can't do that, we might just have to slow ships down so the whale can get away and avoid the suction force of the vessel. But I think ultimately those threats pale to the long-term threat to whales, which is destruction of their habitat, to the things that, that we do to coastlines every day. Humpback whales are coastal animals. What happens along the coastline will affect humpback whales. And whether it's sewage treatment outfalls, which I know you've heard a lot about, oil spills, ocean dumping, all those things are affecting the habitat. The solutions, managing marine habitats, things like national marine sanctuaries, critical habitat, and other areas where we can control what goes on to some extent. And I think this may be an area where humpbacks may be more vulnerable than most whales. In all the work that's gone on around the world, we haven't seen a whole lot of mass mortalities of baleen whales. Well, we've seen two of them right here in New England. The first was in 1987, when 15 humpback whale carcasses were found off of Cape Cod in a single month. And the stomach of these animals, was found, mackerel were found. Those mackerel were tested. This goes back to, remember, the 200 pounds of mackerel? Same mortality. In fact, this is the whale we got it from. And that mackerel tested positive for soxitoxin, which is a form of paralytic shellfish poisoning. <coughs> Just last year, 
National Marine Fisheries Service Aerial Survey has found 18 dead humpback whales on the eastern side of Georgia's bank, as well as three fin whales and three pilot whales. Now, this is 130 to 150 miles offshore. So 18 is a, certainly a very minimal number. It probably at least doubles that, if not goes beyond that. The carcasses were too composed for identification, but they're most likely New England whales. We know that our whales move to and from the northeast peak of Georgia. Because these animals were so far offshore, it was very difficult to get out there. Only two whales were sampled. They were badly deteriorated. Excuse me, four whales were sampled, which were badly decomposed. Two of them tested positive for domoic acid. Now, domoic acid has been, been implicated in many mass marine mammal mortalities in the North Pacific in the past 10 years, none in the Atlantic. This was the first evidence we found of it. This should be a danger sign. Yes? And again, like saxitoxin or brevitoxin, it is a dinoflagellate. It, it's a, a paralytic shellfish poison that builds up through, through the environment. How it got over to the Atlantic from the Pacific, whether it's always been there and we hadn't picked it up on, we really don't know. And I'm not saying that that was the cause of the mortality. All I can say is that two of the four animals' tissues tested positive for it. But to know that there were at least 20 dead humpbacks out there, probably way more than that, and not understand what happened is really tragic. But I think it really points out the take-home message, which is that humpbacks and other whales, as top-level predators, consume huge quantities of prey. And that means that the fate of whales is tied to the quality of, of that prey and their habitat. So as we think about conserving whales, saving whales, and protecting them to recover, what we really need to do is to save their habitat and to save oceans. It's a much tougher task, but there's a lot of good energy that's being paid towards it. There have been two major reports in the past year from the Ocean Commission and the Pew, the Pew Charitable Trust that both come out with good management plans for the ocean. I don't have to tell you guys this. I'm preaching to the choir right here. But I think whales may also represent a unique way to get people to understand and care about the quality of the habitat in which they live in. So I thank you guys for your attention. I know you guys probably have to get back to work. I'll be glad to take care of any questions you may have. But thanks for coming, and I hope you got something out of it. Thanks a lot. <laughs> questions? Yeah. Um, you had a photo of the uh, uh, around the What has the research shown so far the effect of the alcohol? So far, the best research has shown that there's no short-term effect of, of the outfall. My major concern about the outfall is actually a long-term chronic, not a short-term one. Um, my major concern is the amount of toxins it's introducing into the ecosystem. Marine mammals worldwide, especially higher-level marine mammals, show concentrations of toxins that have never been seen in other animals. Killer whales in the, north, in the Northwest showing burdens that classify them as toxic waste dumps, for instance. Belugas in the Gulf of St. Lawrence carrying very high levels as well. Although there's still secondary treatment going on for a lot of that, that effluent that's being pumped out through the outfall pipe, there's still an increased contaminant burden. How that makes its way through the food chain and whether or not it ends up in, in marine mammals is a concern of mine. Um, so that's, and that's something that we're, it's way too soon to be able to tell whether there's a difference or not. In. But have there been any short-term catastrophic effects? I think not. There are a number of people who think that there, the past several years on Stellwagen Bank have been years of relatively low whale use. I can't see anything in the monitoring data that's gone on either through the MWRA or through independent sources that indicates that the outfall pipe has anything to do with it. Um, but I suppose the jury is still out on that a little bit as well. Which you referenced what you just mentioned about the <coughs> well use on Stella in the last few summers. Yep. What's your theories and best theories on it? I don't have one. Um, I think it's too soon to tell. We've, through our, our work, seen fluctuations like this before. Um, in the mid-1980s and the early 1990s, I mentioned a period where there was very low calf survival in the early 1990s, and that was a time when sandlands bottomed out as well. It's possible this is a natural cycle on the part of sandlands, which are the primary prey on Stellwagen. I've heard some people say that the extremely cold winters and relative drought may be leading to conditions which are not conducive to sandlands to breeding, so it may be a short-term environmentally caused thing. I think it's just too early to tell what, what the story on that is. Um, we have a couple of years where, where we know there's not a lot of whale use there. That, that could easily mirror years like 1994 and 1995 as, as well. So I think, I think we need to wait a couple more years and see if this is a longer-term trend or if it's a short-term blip that is part of natural fluctuations.
Yeah, sure. Do, do um, these whales migrate in long distances? Do they use the ocean currents? We don't know what cues they, they use, although it, is, it has been shown that in humpback whales there's magnetite in the brain, which would be a magnetic field receptor. I'm thinking, of, I'm thinking of not of, of navigation, but rather just uh, energetics. Well, just energetics. Yeah, yeah. Like I mean, we, we know the destination points of, of humpback whales. We don't know the migration route, and so I don't know if they're migrating in the Gulf Stream or not. Most of the, there are very few sightings of whales in the Gulf Stream, and it's possible that because the Gulf Stream is so warm, energetically it may actually be tough for a whale. Um, because while they're being pushed up, they're also expending heat. They're expending energy to dump heat. So, I, I think that, that I'd like to see a couple of tags on animals that, that elucidate a little bit what's going on there and, and determine whether or not that's the case. Another question um, is related to the toxins of the mocaps and saxotoxins. Mm -hmm. um, those are affiliated with red tide organisms. Right. My understanding is red tide, red tide organisms are sort of summertime warm water kinds of, that tend to be blooms, and but, but that they're affiliated with warmer temperatures. That begs a question about ocean warming and whether there's a relationship there that's discernible. The 1987 mortality, there was a vector, which was, was the mackerel. The whales were not feeding on, on anything, on the, the dinoflagellate itself. And that, that mackerel stock was actually on a migration south from Canada. And so the, the general thought is that they may have picked that up during the summer off the Canadian coast. I mean, again, this is hypothetical, but the data sort of indicates that, that that was migratory stock and brought it through the area, which is why you saw a November mortality, November, December mortality for a warm water cause. The other thing about 1987, too, that's, that's notable if you go back to that, is that mackerel are actually a fairly rare prey for humpback whales. I think they're very difficult for them to capture, very fast swimming fish. Um, but 1987 was a year of very, very low prey density. Sandlands were down, herring were, were not real high, and that seemed to be a year when whales were working very hard for prey. And so they probably were taking advantage of what is a relatively unusual prey. And we may have, in fact, found why it may have been an unusual prey for, for whales, although it may have just more to do with the fact that mackerel are tough to catch, and so it was a coincidental thing. Um, the Demoic acid mortality, that was mid-July last year. I know inshore in 2002, 2003, we recorded the highest surface temperatures that we had certainly ever recorded in our work out here. There were times where Stellag and Bank, on the surface at least, got up to 75 degrees, and we'd never seen anything like that before. Um, whether or not that had any effect on the offshore waters where those animals were feeding, we don't know. And the other thing is we, don't, we have no idea what the vector is there. We don't know what those animals were feeding on. If they were feeding on something planktonic, they were feeding on a fish that had those in there. Those animals were badly decomposed. Again, very few were sampled. They were necropsied at sea. Stomach contents were impossible to come up with. And so we really, I mean, there's so many mysteries around that mortality. Basically, all we can say is a lot of whales died, and we know very little about why. Yeah. One question about the technology you're using. Yep. You're using, uh, you showed two different things. You showed uh, radar that you guys are tracking, like some of the, the prey that they are eating. It's so, it's so sonar. Sonar. And then you also showed the satellite tagging. Are yep. you guys using those um, together at all to start to look at some of these patterns? Absolutely. I mean, and, and there's, there's other things that can be used as well. Um, one of the people who's talking in this lecture series is a guy named John Callum Bakitas who's worked with blue whales. And, and I encourage you to see his talk because what he's actually done is not only used D tags, but he's had critter cams on the animal at the same time that he's using the D tags. So you can actually see the prey density that the animal is feeding in while you get the data from the D tag indicating where it is and what it's doing. It's a beautiful, beautiful study. Um, we're more working with, we haven't gone to critter cams yet, but we are certainly working with some of those hydroacoustics to look at prey density versus behavior, yes. Great. No problems. Thank you guys very much for coming. Enjoy the rest of the day.